All right. All right, if you're just tuning in, you listen to the African History Network show. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. On the line, we have Andrew Scott Bolsinger. He is the writer. He is a writer for YourBlackWorld.com. He does some articles for YourBlackWorld.com. He wrote a very interesting article, April 16th, entitled Revealed, Reverend Al Sharpton Bankroll by GOP Accused of Spying on Black Activists. Now, this is not a beat up on Reverend Al Sharpton's show. Okay, I just want to let people know that. But we're dealing with news. We're dealing with things that pertain to the African-American community. This is, this is something extremely important on the heels of the April 7th uh, expose that the smokinggun.com did. All right? uh, and, you know, we, we, we talk about articles from yourblackworld.com on our show very frequently. We've had uh, Deshaun Farad on, who's a staff writer for YourBlackWorld.com. We've had him on a few times. Uh, now, Andrew is an author and a speaker. Uh, over a decade-long career in the newspaper industry, Andrew Scott Bolsinger earned more than two dozen awards as a columnist, a political reporter, and editor. He has published the scholarly journals like the Journal of Psychology and Theology in major newspapers like uh, the Boston Globe and on many social media and website platforms. He published his first novel in 2003, If Pennies Could Talk. Um, in 2003, Bo Singer was named the editor-in-chief of a 105-year-old newspaper in Oregon on the verge of extinction. Okay, uh, he led the Ashland Daily Tidings to a um, to a stunning resurgence, earning it the Distinguished Award of General Excellence as the uh, state's top newspaper just three years ago after his arrival. Uh, so we want to welcome to the African History Network show, uh, Andrew Bolsinger. Hello, Andrew. How are you doing tonight, brother? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Okay, okay, good. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We're running a little late, man. Got tied up in the previous hour. Not a problem hour. at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was I, was getting, I was getting interested in the conversation. Okay, sorry about that. Well, you know, I read the article, uh, and, and I, um, uh, I read the article that you wrote April 16th, and uh, I, um, I saw it, actually, I saw it, um, how did I see that? I think I first saw it posted uh, on Dr. Boyce Watkins' Facebook page, and Dr. Boyce Watkins is the founder of yourblackworld.com and some other sites, Black Blue Dog, things like that. And, um, uh, I read the article uh, a couple of times, and then uh, I, I saw your uh, the contact information at the end of it, so I reached out to you and uh, wanted to have you on the show to, you know, just to talk about it and break this down so people could have a better understanding um, uh, about this. Uh, for some people, this type of information, as I was just saying with some of the callers, for, for, for people who live in the New York City area, Brooklyn, Harlem, Queens, New York, things like this. Mm -hmm. They're very familiar with this information, and they're looking at people outside of the uh, outside of the state of New York saying, "You didn't know this." And people outside of <laughs> the state of New York, they're they're reading this and they're like, "What are you talking about?" It's like telling Santa Claus doesn't exist. Okay, no. so um, uh, first off, um, what, let me ask you this: What made you write this article? Let me let me ask you that to start out with. Well, you know, I, I do. I, I've done various articles on uh, African American civil rights leaders. For uh, this is one of the areas of interest and study that I did. Way, I mean, way back when I was in a, a graduate program that dealt with some of the civil rights issues. So I've always followed okay. a lot of the civil rights leaders. This this story, uh, you know, it got assigned to me, and I jumped on it because of uh, the ties to just civil rights movements. You're talking about, you know, one of the leaders, and and with a movement that important. You know, for the credibility of that movement, the leaders have to have uh, the scrutiny that that that's that's worthy of the of the movement. Okay, and when you say this this part, this this story got assigned to you from yourblackworld.com, this story got assigned to you. Is that is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and and this is coming on the heels of the of the expose that the smokinggun.com did um, posted April seventh uh, on on Reverend Al Sharpton, which was extensive, explosive, and supported yeah. by the, uh, the declassified FBI documents that they got through the Freedom of Information Act as well. Okay, right. So, and I think the interesting yeah, part is just the the timeliness of it. I mean, a lot of what came out mm -hmm. in that article had. You know, it had surfaced in the late '80s with some of the articles mm -hmm. that, that had come up. But I think I think what was most significant about it coming up now was the the testimony of why he's an informant, not so much that he's an informant, and that you know that there was some there was mm. some criminal pressure put on him. Mm. Now, now, for, for, 
from uh, what you read and, and your investigation, things like this, why was he an informant? Because uh, the, the reason why he said when he was on uh, Morning Joe and when he was doing damage control, he said that he was uh, testifying against the mafia, uh, trying to because they were what did he say? They were trying to shake down some people or whatever. Yeah. Uh, something very noble. He said, "I'm." He said, "I'm not a rat. I'm a cat." So yeah. why, why did you why did you find out that 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 he turned a uh, secret agent man? Well, you know, again, it comes down to you trust the sources that are being out there. But, for instance, the New York Daily News has a fantastic article about some of past associates who, um, you know, one of the first things that, that Sharpton said is that, of course, he was never used as leverage against the black leadership and black community. And yet you have people like Ahmed Obafemi who's saying, man, I didn't trust that cat back then, you know, cat or a rat. Right. I didn't trust him. He's, he's coming into my house and he's talking to me about this and that and the other. And then you had... Um, you know, others basically talking about, you know, cocaine, cocaine deals that he wanted a piece of and and the fact that, you know, the leverage was put on because of potentially, you know, entrapping him in wanting to be involved in illegal activities. And, you know, one right. of the sources right. in, in some of the articles in New York went so far as to say, you know, Al, Al Sharpton had no choice. I mean, he came, you know, Sharpton was, was quoted as having talked to, talk to one of his associates saying, man, they got me. I, I, I got to do what I got to do. So, I mean, I think right, that's the right, part exactly. that, you know, it, it, it takes that high road off. I mean, for anybody that's been into the, you know, the vices of the criminal justice system, you know, you got hard choices to make. And for him, it, it seems like that hard choice had to do with informing on whoever he was told. And it's not quite the right. noble issue that he wants. If all that's true. And again, that's part of why this story is important and continues to be important is, is how much of all of that is verifiable? Right, exactly. And and uh, Oba, uh, Oba Femi, um talked about, if I remember correctly, in, in your article, he was the one who talked about uh, thinking back that you know Reverend Al Sharpton had a a, suit, uh, a, a briefcase uh, right. when he was coming to him, had a briefcase, and he was <laughs> kind of particular in the way that the briefcase was was sitting and things like this. And then when you read the article from the smokinggun.com, they talk about how he was given a, a briefcase that had a recording device in it. Uh, I think yeah. it was either by the FBI or NYPD. I can't remember which one. I've got the article here, but I can't remember. They actually show you a picture of the briefcase, and they said this is the, uh, <laughs> the, this is, this, this is a briefcase that he, that he used to yeah. record conversations. Okay. Right, and and, so, and Obafemi saying, "Man, I knew that briefcase was pointed at me the whole time." You know, so that's a yeah. concern. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and then the other concern is, uh, and I can't remember if you uh, spoke about it in in your article, but the other concern, and I've heard from other people talking about this, especially those that understand how informants work, you just don't inform one time. No. They keep coming back to you over and over and over again when they think you have some information, and they have you to spy on the people who you are around. So a legitimate question is, is he in a retirement program for informing, right. or is he still informing? That, you know, that, and, that's and one of the things that, you, yeah, it is a legitimate question. And then as you were talking about right before I got on, I mean, you're talking about people who, you know, have been asked to become informants you know, within the mm -hmm. black community and, and can come politely decline as opposed to somebody mm -hmm. that says inform or, or you're going you're going upstate. Well, that's a different that's a different thing. And and when you're and then when, when is that done? Like, you know, what kind of a I don't I'm you know, I don't, I'm not too familiar with how informants work, but when do you suddenly say, okay, my debt's been paid, you're going to let me go and I don't have to work under the thumb of the FBI anymore? I mean, that's a legitimate question. And then of course, you you know part of what my article was about was not just you know Al Sharpton being an informant. It's you know it's a it's a now going on thirty year track record of a very very uh, diverse let's call it diverse associations with you know major players within the Republican Party during his two thousand four campaign uh, lying aligning uh, with Ed Koch in, uh, in in his mayor campaign you know splintering Al Gore's campaign with Ralph Nader things of that nature that would be you know, pretty questionable if you're a diehard Democratic supporter, you know, party supporter. Right. And, and when you right. talk about being somebody who speaks the truth to power, well, you lose mm -hmm. a lot of that, that, that ability if you're really under the thumb of power. 
Right, and and that was the other that was the other part that, that grabbed my attention with this article. Um, Al Sharpton bankrolled by GOP grand old party. Uh, talk yeah. talk about that a little bit here. I'm I'm looking through the article trying to find those different points, but 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 talk about that. What was the ex, uh, the extent to which? And you're referring to this 2004 presidential campaign, correct? That, yeah. That's what yeah. Well, what that that you know, there's an excellent piece in the Village Voice that came out in 2004. It's 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 what it's what makes Alternative Weekly so powerful is they can do long form journalism and really lay it out mm-hmm. there, and, and they build a record. And this was one we were talking about the guy. Who the you know who was who was tapped by the Bush Association in two in 2000 to basically go into Florida and work to cut off the voting you know of of the vote to to ensure the Bush election and you're talking about these are these are black votes in black counties and you have a Republican right. strategist who goes down there and creates uproars with the commu- with the Cuban populations and some of these things to just basically. I mean, they credit him with, with turning the tide of counting black votes in Florida that eventually led to the Bush administration. Well, this guy became a significant fundraiser for Al Sharpton in 2004. I mean, it's just detailed. That's undeniable. They were very close. They met several times. At one point, he was, you know, in particular, was responsible for getting Al's, uh, you know, candidacy in several states because they, you know, to get him on, on the ballots in as many states. And Republicans want an Al Sharpton candidacy, and it's pretty simple because he's going to siphon off votes. He's a splinter candidate who's going to siphon off votes from a Democratic candidate. He's not a viable candidate to win, but if he can be on 50 right. states and pull 2 or 3% of the vote, or especially pull significantly from the black vote, you know, you're going to get close victories going to the Republican Party. Right, and, and you're referring to Ron Stone. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. The GOP strategy you're referring to is Ron Stone. Ron okay. Stone, absolutely. Yeah. Who's... Yeah. So yeah, very yeah. similar in disposition to Al Sharpton, very independent, very flamboyant, very a firebrand, very, very similar personality, but for the Republican side. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and you talk about you talk about this in your article. You say Sharpton denied close association with GOP strategist Ron Stone, the man who played an instrumental role in blocking the vote recount in Florida that helped George W. Bush defeat. Democrat Al Gore in 2000, and uh, then you cite the article from um, the Village Voice, and I'm going to pull it up here and let people know the title of it, so they can check that out. It's called Sleeping uh, with the Enemy, I believe. Uh, let me make sure I've got it right here. It's called Sleeping with the Enemy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a good article. Oh, Sleeping okay, with the GOP. Sorry. Right Sleeping, Sleeping with the with GOP, GOP. A Bush convert. Yeah. A Bush covert okay. operative takes over Al Sharpton's campaign. Mm, mm, mm. Now, um, so now Sharpton is denying Ron Stone took over his campaign or was working with him. Anything? Is he, is he denying everything? No, he doesn't deny it. it again, he minimized oh. it. I mean, p- perhaps one of the things that's more telling is that he likened it to Bill Clinton's strategy of using Dick Morris. And um, okay. I don't know if, in, if you're in the presidential history, Dick Morris was a, a controversial figure within the Clinton campaign because he was a. If, if, if anything, Morris was basically a bona fide, you know, hired hand. He'd go to anybody with the money, and he was a, as a key pollster and a key strategist. And he played a central role in Bill Clinton's first term of tacking him back to the middle, making him more moderate, and, and so that he would be more palatable for a second election. Well. You know, he, Dick Morris is not a popular guy with diehard Democrats because they believe he, you know, toned down Bill Clinton's natural progressive tendencies. Well, so now Sharpton saying, you know, my use of Ron Stone is no different than Dick Morris in, in the Clinton administration. And, and there is a lot of difference. Dick Morris was never the key fundraiser and was never somebody that had that much authority. I mean, at one point, uh, Ron Stone was, was basically getting loans for Sharpton's campaign, which you know, I, I don't even know if he still paid him back. The debt went on so long. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and in 2004, you had uh, um, um, John Kerry running on the Democratic uh, ticket. He was a Democratic front runner, and right. the theory from the GOP was if they ran Al Sharpton, he would take away uh, critical votes away from uh, John Kerry, which would help strengthen. The uh, which would help out the, the GOP candidate at the time. Right. Is that correct? 
Okay. Yeah, and, and absolutely. And because what you have is, I mean, literally, the George Bush, you know, didn't win the popular election in 2000, um, and only won the mm -hmm. electoral college because of Florida and because of Ralph Nader's splinter campaign. Ralph Nader effectively, as a Green Party candidate, pulled two to three percent, you know, straight across the board in key states. That's the difference of wins. Well, now you don't you don't necessarily have a Ralph Nader against John Kerry, but Al Sharpton can can serve the same role. And even beginning early on, Al Sharpton was one of the first critics of Howard Dean, who people forget what a favorite he was. I mean, before the first yes. primary, he was the guy that everybody was saying was going to win. Sharpton was the right. first critic out on, on Dean saying he didn't have enough blacks in his administration, um, you know, even mm -hmm. though he came from Vermont, which is, you know, a, a, a pretty white state. I mean, let's be real. So, you right, know, he, right. was, he was a very uh, polarizing candidate, to say the least. And to find out that he was well funded by the Republican Party is, you know, that's concerning. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'll tell you, man, I was in uh, Philadelphia this past weekend, and I talked to uh, some people, uh, some some uh, older people in the National Action Network, man, and uh, man, it, it made me wonder how much they understood history. Uh, I'll tell you the truth, some of the right. things they were, you know, I'm trying to ex I'm, I'm trying to explain certain things to them, man, and it's just like they were. Um, under hypnosis or something like that. Yeah. Well, we'll go to the call. Uh, can, can you take a, can you take a few uh, callers? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Callers? Okay, okay. We'll go to the phone lines in just a minute, guys. Uh, the call in number is area code nine one four three three eight thirteen seventy five nine one four three three eight thirteen seventy five. Press the number one key to put you in queue so we can bring you on the air. We, uh, we're going to a commercial break in a few minutes here. Uh, press the number one key to put you in queue so we can bring you on the air. We are speaking with Andrew Bolsinger, who is a writer for YourBlackWorld.com. You know, we talk about articles from Your Black World all the time. We've had Deshaun Farad on a number of times uh, uh, on this show. Uh, uh, Andrew Bolsinger wrote an article entitled um, uh, Revealed, Reverend Al Sharpton Bankrolled by GOP Accused of Spying on Black Activists. This was posted April 16th, 2014, YourBlackWorld.com. So now, once again, when you call in, we want to make, make it clear, this is not a bash Reverend Al Sharpton show, but we're, we're dealing with news. We're trying to deal with facts and evidence. We're trying to deal with this article and break it down so we can understand this, okay? Um, uh, and you know I've those who listen to my show, you know, I've had my criticism and disagreements uh, about Reverend Al, Reverend Al Sharpton in the past, but there are also things that I've defended him on because I said, you know, we can disagree with him, but we, we can't make things up, okay? I'm not, not trying to lie on him or things like this. Even a broken clock is right twice a day, all right? But <laughs> there's some strong things that we <laughs> have some concerns about when I see certain things taking place. And once again, I've listened to his show uh, his radio show, Keeping It Real, for seven years. So I know what he says. I listen to him. I was listening to him today. Okay? All right. Um, okay, look, stand by. We, we have to take a commercial break. You listen to the African History Network show, and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Guess what time it is? It's tax time. G&G &G Associates Tax Preparation Services is a black-owned business Focus on easing our clients' minds on all their tax preparation needs. We guarantee to beat any other tax professional's price. All new clients will receive a $40 discount. If you are a senior, you'll get a 20% discount. And all African History Network listeners will get a 15% discount. For more details, visit our website at www.gngassociates.net and click on the Taxes tab. Or call us at 877-220-8333. Again, the website is www.gngassociates.net. Freeing up capital to make investments may not be as hard as you think. For those of you who have Facebook accounts, send me a friend request over there on Facebook and LinkedIn to Tahaka Amana El Bay. That's T-A-R-A-H-A-K-A. -A -A. Amana is A-M-A-A-N-A -A -A -A, and then E-L and of course B-E-Y. And you'll be able to see the actual documents clearly showing you how I was able to cancel my mortgage and property taxes contracts and that way I have freed up capital for investments. To get the apparatus to do this weird, go to www. 
NewDebtElimination.com. That's www.NewDebtElimination.com. It's not as hard as you think. Send a friend request on Facebook, and I'll grant that request so you can actually see the documents for yourself. Peace. Got body fat, obesity, overweight, constipation, gas, acid reflux, gout, edema, arthritis, and swelling? We've got just the product for you from the African Aloe Ferox plant. African Aloe Ferox bitter crystals, drink, and tea will help to regulate, cleanse, and detoxify your body, making you much more healthier and vibrant by balancing out your entire digestive tract. Try Aloe Ferox by Alki Naturals. You can visit our website for more details and testimonials at www.alkinaturals.com. Also, for all African History Network listeners, you can get a 25% discount by using coupon code AHN25OFF. Again, that website is www.alkinaturals.com. Remember, God may forgive you, but your body won't. My Hotep African History Network family, this is Michael M. Hotep, host of the African History Network show and co-host of the Per Ankh Hour Questions and Answers show with Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, also known as Booker T. Coleman. I want to let you know that my new lecture, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, What They Didn't Teach You in School, is now available at theafricanhistorynetwork.com. It's item number 712. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the indigenous people of North, Central, and South America and have been in the U.S. at least 51,700 years. We can't start studying our history in slavery. When we look at the transatlantic slave trade, we cannot look at it episodically. We have to understand the sequence of historical events. We have to understand the Moors going into the Iberian Peninsula also known as Spain and Portugal in 711 AD and taking teachings from ancient Kemet also known as Egypt to Europeans in Europe. We have to understand how this influenced Christopher Columbus and his four voyages and the technology that he was using to set sail with. We have to understand how Christopher Columbus laid the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, the exploitation of indigenous people, and how this opens up the new world to exploitation by other European nations, Portugal and France and Germany and Belgium, etc. Once we understand this, then we can look at the transatlantic slave trade. We can't start in 1619, we can't start in 1555, we can't start in 1526 with Spain bringing Africans into the territory today known as South Carolina. Some of the things that we deal with in this presentation also include how European white supremacy is like the Wizard of Oz, the intellectual capital that was taken out of Africa during the slave trade, some of the skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in the U.S. up until 1865 that built this country, and much, much more. This is a four and a half hour presentation it is the culmination of at least four years of research that I've been doing on various subjects, including the transatlantic slave trade. Once again, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, is item number 712 at theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Order your copy today, and for more information, you can also call us at 313-462-0003. 313-462-0003 and you can also email us at theahnshow at gmail.com theahnshow at gmail.com Mod Hotep and hope to hear from you soon. Alright, welcome back to the African History Network show. Uh, once again, if you have a question or comment, give us a call on 914-338-1375 914-338-1375 338-1375. We have Andrew for a few more minutes. We're speaking with Andrew Bolsinger, who uh, is a uh, writer for YourBlackWorld.com. He's written, he's written uh, various articles for Your Black World. Uh, but the article we're speaking of tonight uh, was posted April 16th on YourBlackWorld.com. It's entitled Revealed, Reverend Al Sharpton Bankrolled by GOP Accused of Spying on Black Activists. Okay, so very, very interesting article. Uh, it has supporting um, uh, references and articles uh, to, to back up what, he, what he's talking about. Uh, let's bring Andrew back on. 
Okay, Andrew, you still there? Absolutely. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Um, screen's freezing up a little bit on me. Okay, we'll just hold no on for a few more minutes here. A uh, very interesting article, and uh, now uh, I, I know there was one article from the Village Voice. Uh, I, I saw that. What were some of the other sources uh, that you utilized to, 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 to back up this article to put this together? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things, and I think that's important to talk about because, you know, with all the hype about the latest re revelations about the informant, what I wanted to do mm -hmm. was talk more of a launch, you know, a longer term issue. If there's one thing that drove my article, it's the idea that you're talking about a guy who's made his reputation as speaking truth to power. To do that, mm -hmm. you have to be out from under the thumb of power. And one of the things that I found in, in, in doing this article, and there's, there's really more that have come since I've written the article, is that from the very beginning of, of, of Reverend Sharpton's organizations, he has had legal and financial troubles that have put him in vulnerable positions. So for instance, one thing that's not even in my article, but is a guy that I'm right now talking to is by the name of Donald Thomas, who was the co-founder of Reverend Sharpton's first movement. This is back in 1973. It's the National Youth Movement. Um, you know, they've, uh, Donald Thomas isn't even recognized as, as having played a significant role. Everybody that they ever talk about that organization says Reverend Sharpton founded this by himself when he was at the age of 16. Well, Donald Thomas shows, at, you know, has sources that he's given me and he has out on the website that show that he's under oath. He's been subpoenaed. He was a founder of that. And, and, and talked about how, um, you know, at night, in the 1990 trial, people forget you can't even find it. Reverend Trumpton was brought in for a tax and fraud trial because of mm -hmm. misrepresenting that organization that's now defunct. And here's the co-founder of it who has significant mm -hmm. documents who are saying, yeah, they were over, you know, he was talking about having, you know, 40 some odd organizations or, or 40 different um we call them branches, and he said we didn't have that on the enrollment. We didn't have that tax documents that weren't there. You know, basically committing fraud. And at the time, Sharpton dismissed mm -hmm. him as a crackpot who wanted a free trip to New York. I mean, it just doesn't it doesn't have any validity. This goes back to 1973. So we're talking about 1973 leading to a 1990 trial for significant financial problems and fraud. You're talking about the 1980s. Um, you've got a guy named Bob Carrington who's saying he, Sharpton told him directly that he was involved in a bad cocaine bust that put him under the, the thumb of the FBI as an informant. You've got a black right. nationalist who's saying in, in, the, in that same time frame that he was being targeted, which is the one thing Sharpton said he was not turned on the black community, and he's saying he was absolutely targeted. And then and you've got him all the way in 2004 being bankrolled by the, the GOP, and now, in two, it's starting in 2008, you know, he's an outspoken supporter of President Obama. So, so where's the truth to power? That's the question. Right, right. <laughs> right exactly, exactly. And also, where's the truth um, or the power? I mean, right, exactly. <laughs> and and uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, actually, when the story broke. I, um, uh, well, when the story from SmokingGun.com broke, um, I shared briefly the article written by. Um, Attorney Alton Maddox on his website, uh, Reinstate mm -hmm. Alton Maddox, and it was entitled, uh, Is Reverend Al, or, uh, Is Reverend Al a Rat? And mm -hmm. Alton Maddox was, was talking about the 67 count indictment indictment that um, uh, Reverend Al Sharpton was dealing with in 1990, and it was Alton Maddox yeah. that got all 67 counts uh, dismissed. Okay? Right. Exactly. So. So uh, it is very. I think people should really read that article. Uh, and so it's a very, very interesting article uh, on um, reinstate uh, Alton, Alton Maddox, uh, dot com. Uh, now you said there were some new developments that have come, that have come out since this since this article you did April sixteenth. Yeah, I didn't have any mention of Donald Thomas. He contacted me after this article, and um, mm. and so uh, you know I'm just starting to talk to him. But for instance, if you go, he has this personal website, which has really uh, it's all he's an interesting guy, health and fitness freak. He's got Gen uh, Guinness Books of World Records for human endurance and all these different things. But he has a page dedicated to Al Sharpton and his involvement with Al Sharpton, and he says that basically the rationale is. Um, you know, he was slandered by Sharpton. He was a co-founder of the National Youth Movement, 
And um, he was the only one that testified under oath to that effect. And that at the very first question that Sharpton's lawyers asked him is, are you aware, do you know what perjury is? And then right from his website, he says, at no time over my almost four hours of testimony was I charged with perjury. And he has document after document that shows, you know, that he was at that point making serious accusations and serious testimony under oath to uh, the formation of the first movement, the first nonprofit organization that, that Al Sharpton ever started, which was the National Youth Movement. And hey. Sharpton dismissed him with a quote that said, he knows nothing about the National Youth Movement because he was nothing, a complete crackpot. That's a quote from Sharpton. And yet, if you look back, I mean, he, he, there's one document that I'm staring at now, which is a National Youth Movement brochure. And on the top, it's the, it says, Reverend Al Sharpton, Jr., founder and chairman, Donald Thomas, vice chairman. Well, this, this is a guy he says knows nothing about the movement. <laughs> So, I mean, there's some serious, you know, there's some serious questions about the integrity uh, of a man who's made his living on, on, you know, speaking truth to power. And also, you know, you guys mentioned, you know, his wealth. Um, you know, mm -hmm. certainly there's no problem with anybody prospering, but, but you know, right. he is the 1%. I mean, yeah, he makes 250000 a year through his national nonprofit organization, but he's also... He's in the same spot right. that Keith Olbermann made $4 million a year on an MSNBC, and yet he's got serious tax problems that have followed him around for, for a long period of time. I mean, debt and tax problems, and I think he's an organization, I think it's gotten paid down now. But, I mean, one of the questions is, I mean, that you brought up was what about all these people? You, you mentioned somebody saying, you know, hey, your tax problem goes away if you'll become an informant. Well, the guy's already an informant. What more does he have to offer? Well, well. <laughs> The, the, the question is, is if he's still informing, who is he informing on now? Who's right. around him? <laughs> Things like that. Exactly. That's the question. That's the question that's exactly that a, right. lot of, a, lot, a lot of people are wondering about. Okay. When now, do you retire I, I, from I, the I, FBI I, as an informant? I mean, when do they finally say, okay, you did a nice job. You don't have to, you don't have to it, ride anymore. It, I, mean, exactly, I don't know when that happens. Exactly. Maybe you go into witness protection or something. I don't know, man. <laughs> 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 Let's see. Now, um, are, are there any other recent articles that you have with uh, your Black World? Uh, no, I. The, what I'm talking about now is stuff I have not published yet. It's just stuff that I'm I'm working on now. Hopefully, we publish somewhere else, and um, you'll see it soon. I I hope because I think it's really valuable. Especially, I think Don, Donald Thomas uh, has some important things to say. I mean, he goes back to 1973 with a close association with with Al Sharpton. And one of the questions that I've asked him is. Okay, you're, how do you communicate to a 2014 audience why this is important? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think the way he has to answer that and, and what he eventually has to say will make some good news because the bottom line is um, you're talking about a sustained pattern that, of compromising his, his ability to be independent of, of the powers that be. Okay. Um, and how can people get in contact with you? And I know you operate your website, uh, criminalyou.co as well. So, so uh, you yep. can tell us about that as well if you'd like to. Yeah, that's a prison reform-based uh, website. Um, I, lo I love the fact that you introduced me with all the good stuff that's happened to me. But, you know, we're talking about truth. Let's be honest. I've had some bad stuff too, including um, you know, alcoholism. I was going to let you talk uh, about that. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I uh, – fell on my face in a fairly big way. I got, I got arrested myself. I know all about that. And I did some time mm -hmm. in prison. And, and um, one of the things that I'm working on now and dedicated to now is, uh, po is positive prison reform. And what I mean by that is that prison reform that focuses on the, humani uh, the humanity that's inside of prisons and the real issues rather than all of the political and economic debate, but the moral imperative of that human beings are not, are not you know, human storage, that they're valuable even when they've screwed up significantly and they've got stuff to contribute. So um, Criminal U is just a, it's just a place where we, you know, one of the first things I learned when I went to prison was they said basically, you know, prison isn't going to teach you anything about how to stop what you're doing. They're going to teach you how to do, you know, crime better. And everything that I found, it was, that was true, and yet every inmate that goes through has to make a choice, and every inmate has to make a choice of whether, which way they're going to go when they get back out. And there's a lot of people who, um, who are significantly con you know, committed to changing, and yet the entire system is set up to fail. And so you know, we need to change that dialogue. And, and, and to be real honest, that is becoming 
of all of the issues. When I first started writing about this a couple of years ago, there was an article in the New York Times that said there's no political will for prison reform, and yet in the last four months we've seen not only what President Obama and Eric Holder are doing on a, on a historic level um, for clemency and for freeing, uh, for, for, especially for blacks who've been, who've been way overrepresented in the prison systems, but now you've got conservatives at places like CPAC where you have the likes of, of Rick Perry saying, you know, I'm the model for prison reform. We're not tough on crime. We're smart on crime. And once again, the Republicans are stealing the stage. It's just amazing. <laughs> the same people that built right, this right. prison industrial industry are going to be the ones that profit from tearing it down. So it's an important issue and it's something that I think we'll see continue. Okay. And give us your website again. Uh, it's www.criminalu.co. Okay. That's criminal, the letter U. Dot co, yeah. by Criminal University, yeah. Out. And in fact, yeah, you can you can follow the, our group on Twitter at, at Criminal Universe, um, Criminal U N I V, and there's Twitter posts and that kind of thing. And, and Criminal U is, it's it, you know I do most of the writing for it, but but it's a it's a, it's a growing coalition of people whose lives have been touched by the criminal justice system and want to work towards positive change. And it's just bringing an incredibly diverse group of people together um, who have incredible stories to tell. And so, you know, it's just, it's, it's probably the most meaningful thing that I've done in my lifetime. Wow. Wow. Okay. That's great. And, you know, I worked with, uh, I worked with returning citizens. Uh, I, I live in Detroit and uh, I was, uh, I helped to manage a uh, uh, construction trades program. Uh, through mm -hmm. a company that I was managing, and uh, we worked with a, a local community college here, uh, and we taught construction construction trades uh, through the community college. So we, we dealt with underserved populations. We had uh, a, 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 a significant segment that were returning citizens or or uh, uh, ex offenders, and um, you know, so I, I definitely understand that. And a lot of people are under the impression that. Uh, a lot of uh, returning citizens or ex offenders, you know, don't want to work. That's not the case. They they want to work, no. but oftentimes they have uh, other problems going on. They may have they may they may have some type of uh, learning disability. They 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 may yeah. be illiterate in some you know to some degree. Things like this. Um, so, so there could be a number of different factors, and uh, you know, we had guys that that had skills. They just made mistakes, ended up in prison, but they had skills. Some of them were good carpenters, things like this. Others wanted yep. to learn, you know. So, yep. so uh, you know, that's something that's ex extremely important. So people can uh, check that out as well. Follow you on Twitter, uh, criminal U N I V, and then uh, also uh, criminal the letter U dot C O uh, is your website. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, well, and you know, to that uh, end, one of the things that go ahead, go ahead. Uh, last last thing, but one of the things we're talking about when you were talking about the challenges that are there, uh, a significant part of of some of the work that I'm doing is working with inclusive uh, communities and in inclusive organizations that are trying to empower people of color in the tech and entrepreneurial uh, 21st century economies. And one of the great places that we can do that in, and we're starting to try to do that, and we have some programs, is within prisons. Because that is an entrepreneurial mindset of people that are in prisons, and they know going mm -hmm. out that they have that box felon check next to their name, which makes it really hard to just go do like your mama said and go get a job. It's going to be hard to do. Right. But the, if we can right. take inmates and make them entrepreneurs and innovators who are job creators, you're not only taking somebody off of the system that has been the most expensive person on the system, it's, it costs more to, to incarcerate an adult than it does to educate a child in many of our states in the country. And, but you're now, mm -hmm. if you can get one of those people to be a, an innovator, he's now not only a, or she is not a, is a, con, a contributor, but a job creator. And it's just, it, it sets the whole thing on its ear. So there's tremendous so, things happening. So that's an initiative that you all, that you all are working on also, a criminal Yep. Youth? Yep. Yep, you'll see okay. more and more about it, um, and you'll see uh, pilot programs to that effect, and it's just it's just great stuff because the the bottom line is you know especially ever since uh, the president's my brother's keeper initiative came out, I mean what we're talking about is an achievement gap, but that achievement gap is if you look around, you know there's people all over, people of color, people of every kind of minority group. I mean we're talking about moving into a culture where minority majorities are anyways. We have to be a significant investment on the GDP and contributing, you know, generational wealth and job creation within uh, community, you know, what I like to call urban blind spots. 
And it doesn't matter who lives right. there, but we all know they get missed, whether it's your Detroit or my San Francisco or wherever. Those people get missed. And if we can go into those areas and create urban and tech solutions and empowering especially the people who have fallen through the cracks the most, which are the people in prison, you have dramatic, remarkable changes ahead. Okay, and people can find out information about that on your website also, criminal That's .co. Absolutely. That's CO. Okay. Yep. Okay, absolutely. Well, look, Andrew, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule coming on the African History Network show. Let me know when your other articles okay. come out. We'll have to have you back on, okay? I'll look forward to it, and as soon as we have something else out, I'll, I'll send it your way. Okay, okay, thanks, buddy. Take care. Have a good night. Thanks a bunch. Okay. All right, you listen to the African Work show that was Andrew Bolsinger, um, writer for YourBlackWorld.com, talking about his article uh, revealed Reverend Al Sharpton bankrolled by GOP accused of spying on black activists. Once again, we're not trying to bash Reverend Al Sharpton. I don't hate Reverend Al Sharpton, anything like that. Those that, that have listened to the African History Network show, if you listen for uh, a year, two years, something like that, you know, I, I've defended him on this show for things that some people said that was just totally inaccurate. I'd say we need to deal with facts and evidence. We can't make things up, okay? Um, but when you, you're dealing with evidence that like came out in the article, uh, the, the expose that the smokinggun.com uh, did, when I'm doing research and I'm talking to people in the uh, uh, Brooklyn and Harlem area, things like this about uh, some historical things, uh, when we're dealing with articles like this, then you know you, you're dealing with the evidence, and, and Reverend Al Sharpton admitted working with the FBI and the, and the New York Police Department as well. Okay, and he did not say that the FBI documents that the SmokingGun.com had. He did not say that those documents were false or were forgeries or anything like that. What he said was he and his attorneys were going to go over the documents to determine uh, their veracity. Okay, which means that he knows that there are some actual documents out there. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, you listen to the African History Network show. We'll be back in a few minutes. If you have a question or comment, give us a call, 914-338-1375, 914-338-1375. In our third hour, we're going to be joined by Abiyomi Ezekwe, editor of the Pan-African Newswire. We're going to talk about the attack on affirmative action uh, that was just handed down, the decision from the uh, U.S. Supreme Court that just came down Tuesday, Michigan's uh, ban on affirmative action upheld by Supreme Court. Uh, and this is an article from CNN.com, Michigan's ban on uh, affirmative action upheld by Supreme Court that you can check out. Uh, we'll talk about that and some other uh, um, decisions from the Supreme Court that are, are really uh, making, that are really going to make things very hard, very difficult for African Americans in this country. And this is why we have to focus more on self-reliance, uh, economic empowerment, supporting our own businesses, circulating our dollar. Uh, uh, it should be 8 to 12 times, but since it only goes one time, we need to go from spending 2% of our dollars with our own people to 10%. Okay? We did start there. We can, we can go from 2% to 10%. In one to two years, we can create one to two million jobs. All right? And uh, about 64% of African-American-owned businesses uh, oh, sorry, about 64% of the employees at African-American-owned businesses are other African-Americans also, okay? So um, this is very, very uh, significant. I will be in the Louisville, Kentucky area. Uh, I'll be, well, not the area, I'll be in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, this Sunday, April 27th, I'm doing a presentation 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., uh, more education and enrichment training, also known as MEET, and the African Village and Cultural Center of Louisville, Kentucky, are bringing me in to do a presentation. I'm doing an overview of my presentation, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, What They Didn't Teach You in School, and also I'm doing a uh, short presentation, uh, When Black Men Dominated the Horse Racing. This is a presentation and discussion with myself, Michael M. Hotel, host of the African History Network show. Uh, th this will be at 3415 Bardstown Road, Suite 405, Louisville, Kentucky, B-A-R-D-S-T-O-W-N. It's on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It's in the email newsletter I sent out today. Um, to sign up for our email newsletter, just text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. Uh, or you can go to our website, and it's there also. You can sign up there as well. Donation is $10, free food and refreshments. Uh, for more information, call 
502-459-6111 or email moreeducationandenrichment at gmail.com. That's M-O-R-E, education and enrichment at gmail.com. So it's going to be a fantastic uh, presentation. Definitely look forward to seeing my Louisville, Kentucky family and the brothers and sisters of the African Village in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. So definitely come on out. Okay, we'll be back in a few minutes. You're listening to the African History Network show. Guess what time it is? It's tax time. G&G Associates Tax Preparation Services is a black-owned business focused on easing our clients' minds on all their tax preparation needs. We guarantee to beat any other tax professional's price. All new clients will receive a $40 discount. If you are a senior, you'll get a 20% discount. And all African History Network listeners will get a 15% discount. For more details, visit our website at www.gngassociates.net and click on the Taxes tab or call us at 877-220-8333. Again, the website is www.gngassociates.net. Okay, everybody, we've just launched our new website. It's www.newdebtelimination.com. That's newdebtelimination.com. You can click on the navigational links up top. Uh, there's the uh, home link, the services link. Uh, the donation uh, page link is there as well. Uh, when you get ready to uh, own your own business, uh, for those of you who own your own business or want to own your own business, uh, there's a link available up top for that. Also, all of the previous audios that we've done on our wealth building classes. So click on the wealth building class link uh, for all your previous audio. You can go in any time you get ready. And as we go along, we'll add our new audio uh, plugs under that title the uh, wealth building class link. Okay? www. NewDebtElimination.com Hello everyone, this is Michael M. Hotep, host of the African History Network show and founder of the African History Network. As many of you know, we've been doing the African History Network show on Blog Talk Radio for four years now. It will be four years, March 10th. We have thousands of listeners across the country. We have about uh, over 100,000 followers on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. And we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. We've interviewed a lot of our top scholars on African history and African culture, things of this nature, and people have been learning a lot. Uh, I've been given the opportunity to also host a show on the Empowerment Radio Network. Now, the Empowerment Radio Network was founded by Dave Anderson, and on this network they have Warren Valentine, and also the legendary Bev Smith. Uh, they have 500,000 listeners on the Apartment Radio Network, and they are on TuneIn Radio as well, the TuneIn.com uh, uh, website and the TuneIn app on your smartphone, your iPhone, Android phone, uh, your, your tablet, what have you. They have about 250,000 listeners on TuneIn alone, and uh, they are carried the various shows are carried on different uh, AM radio stations in different markets across the country. So I have an opportunity to also host a uh, show on Sunday evenings, uh, most likely Sunday evenings, and this will be the African History Network show once again. It will be a two-hour show. And to do this, I have to uh, purchase some industry standard equipment because I'll be broadcasting from a home. Uh, the uh, station is in uh, Atlanta. I live in Detroit, as many of you know. So I have to purchase some industry standard equipment to allow me to broadcast. This is much different than blog talk radio. Okay, so that's going to be a pretty sizable investment, somewhere around three thousand dollars. Also need to get a uh, newer laptop because my laptop is about four years old and it's slower and freezes up on me oftentimes, things of this nature. So this is a big opportunity. A lot of people are going to learn a lot from my show, from the guests that I bring on, from the information I have, the articles that I share, things of this nature. The same thing that I do uh, on the African History Network show that I've been doing for four years. We're also going to do this on Sunday evenings on the Apartment Radio Network. So 
I'm asking uh, you, those who listen to my show, those who see this uh, video, we have a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo.com. Indiegogo.com. So uh, you can contribute what you can. And we have some perks also uh, for you as well. We have, we have that listed on our Indiegogo site. Uh, you can go to our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We have the information there in the link to our Indiegogo site. Uh, or you can just go to Indiegogo.com and search for The African History Network. The African History Network, we have the information there also. Uh, secondly, uh, the other reason why uh, I'm trying to raise funds as well is because um, I want to also have a 24-hour internet radio station. Many of you are familiar with uh, the internet uh, radio station that Dr. Ray Higgins has. Uh, but I want to have something like that. I've been talking about it for some time, but just now really getting around to really being able to do something like that. So we also want to raise funds, secondly, for the 24-hour Internet radio network uh, that I'm going to have where I can play uh, my lectures 24 hours a day, play some lectures from other scholars, play ex some interviews I've done because I've done uh, hundreds of interviews uh, over the past four years, so I can play interviews and things like this on this 24-hour network as well. So uh, two things that we're trying to do, raise funds for uh, me to get a show on the apartment radio network and to pay for the equipment that's needed to broadcast a show that I've already been offered, and number two, to raise funds to create a 24-hour uh, internet radio network, which would be the African History Network. Uh, and uh, we can play lectures 24 hours a day, uh, interviews that I've done, things like this. So there's a lot uh, happening in 2014. This is a very powerful time, and uh, appreciate uh, uh, you supporting the African History Network. In the past, those who are just finding about it, uh, finding out about us, check out our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Tune into the African History Network show every Thursday, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On, on blogtalkradio.com forward slash the African History Network show and also I'm the co-host of the Per Ankh Hour Questions and Answers show with Professor Booker T. Coleman also known as Kaba Kamene of Hidden Colors 1 and 2 and we do that show on my network every Wednesday 10 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as well. So um, hope everybody is doing well. Thanks for your time and uh, tune in uh, to our show. Hope to talk to you soon. Peace.